There's nothing much better than fresh salsa, and it's even better, absolutely fresh from the garden, and better still if it's basically free, because every single ingredient is homegrown. Here it is finished, and it could just as well be redder or oranger looking. The reason it's green is I did use a lot of green ingredients, and my tomatoes are yellow, so they don't overpower the green. Later in the season, I'll have some reds, though. I used about 30 of these little cluster grape tomatoes that are ripe when they're yellow, plus one of these mystery tomatoes that was supposed to be one of those and is clearly something different. It's tasty, though. And later in the season, I will use these Parks tomatoes. This is a photo from last year. The Parks Whopper aren't quite ready yet. So tomatoes are the base. Next, peppers. These are shisitos. I had three green ones ready to use. You use what you can as it comes available. Removing the seeds from shisitos is optional. I chose to do so, but generally people find them tolerable to eat. Next, I added five small green pepadus. They get about twice the size they are now when they're mature, and they turn bright red. Pepidus are tricky because you can eat them either green or red, and early in the season, from my experience, they are what they've been described to be, which is sweet and slightly spicy. However, later in the season, towards the end of summer, when it's been really hot, they get incredibly hot, jalapeno hot, although the flavor is very different, and the seeds are the hottest part of all. So just to keep this salsa within the moderate range, I'm de-seeding the pepidus. These are two and three-year-old plants growing in 17-gallon muck tubs. I've been able to overwinter them in a greenhouse, so they're really mature now. As of mid-June, the plants are covered with blossoms and juvenile fruits, which will eventually get about twice this big, but they can be eaten from now on. Next, we need some onions. Because it already has gotten hot in the year, my best bet is to use these green multiplier onion tops. These are a Japanese multiplying onion variety called Scarlet Bandit because down below the bulbs are mine aren't scarlet, but they have some red. And I'm seeing what will happen if I let one self sow right here. This is one of the very most heat tolerant onions that I've ever grown and I'm able to harvest green onion tops and just leave the bulbs right through the summer and still have those tops be tender and delicious as we want them to be in salsa. Then they regrow new top leaves. So it's a very efficient use of the plant material as food because you can use it multiple times. Cilantro is pretty essential for classic salsa and the problem with it is that it does not thrive in the summer heat where I live. This is a hot climate. So to our rescue comes Vietnamese coriander or Vietnamese cilantro, which is this plant. The flavor is remarkably similar and there's a bonus. I'm one of the people who finds that normal cilantro has a soapy aftertaste. So this has all of the zest and no soapy aftertaste. The leaves are tender and can be cut up along with everything else in the salsa. By the heat of the summer, the stems are a little bit tough. So I like to not only pull the leaves off, but check the leaves for central spines that would also be tough. Next, epizote. You can use both the leaves and the parts that are flowering and going to seed. This is something that you don't want to use in excess of, but a little bit of it adds so much flavor. Epizote is one of those plants that will normally self-sow in the garden if you do allow it to go to seed. It may self-sow a little bit more than you had in mind, but it's very easy to get up the seedlings if they fall where you don't want them. Up until now, all the ingredients are classics. You've used them many times before. Here comes the secret ingredient that I've learned to love. It is purslane. This is a low-growing succulent plant that has been used for centuries, literally, as a salad green, although it has fallen out of style in the last couple hundred years. Generally, it's considered a weed, but I bought seed from Thompson & Morgan 30-some years ago on purpose 
supposedly an improved culinary variety, but I have little to compare it to because it was not a native weed here. You can see how easy it is to let itself sow and then pull it out of places where you don't want it. This is a garden path and I'll harvest it out. But we can eat what I pull out. The great thing about it, besides the fact that it's really nutritious, is that it has a lot of liquid, so it contributes to the sauciness of the salsa. And it also has a faintly citrusy taste. Nothing strong, just a perfect complement to the other ingredients. And because it's prolific, it can really contribute to the volume of salsa that you can get out of a relatively small amount of vegetables. During the hot part of the summer, the leaves and the very young parts of the stems are still tender and tasty. The thicker, older stems are coarser and stiffer, as with so many plants, and I prefer to trim them out. Now, you can use the modern way of making salsa, which is to chop everything small enough that the food processor will do a good job, and proceed with the food processor, or go forward with my maximally old school method, which is to chop everything fine enough that you can move on, and then chop it finer still, still using the knife, and then put it into the mortar and pestle and process it that way. Just keep going until you love the texture. It'll get to any texture you want. It just takes a little patience. Towards the end of the processing, stir in salt to taste, and that's it. I began with a loosely filled gallon bowl full of vegetables and ended up with about a cup and a quarter of the salsa finished. Naturally, if you do the sensible thing and use ingredients as they are available, it will be slightly different every time you make it, but always delicious.